Thumbs up. Excellent. I am Dr. Kennington. Um, I work at Boise State University, just right uh, down there. <laughs> down there. I work down there. So I, 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 um, <laughs> I've been here for about two years. It's been great, Boise State. Um, before that, I got my PhD in, in Bielefeld, Germany. Um, and, I do, <laughs> and I do a lot of stuff in natural language processing. And I also teach the deep learning course. I'm, this semester, I'm teaching the 533. Um, data science course and also programming languages and there's one other one I don't remember. The talk today is largely about my my research but also all of some of the philosophical stuff surrounding it. So you kind of know what what I'm talking about what what, uh, what my stance is here and maybe you can learn something along the way and think about something along the way. Um, so meaning language and intelligence in, in machines. Uh, let's start off, and this is, I've, I've given a talk similar to this before, um, so, but I've, I've updated it, there's some new stuff, so hope you uh, get something from this. Read my note from today. Okay, I found this note. Your note from today says, Alexa, tell me about my 3 p.m. appointment. That's all. Here is the next event. Today, at 3 p.m., there's OK Google. What is in my calendar at 4 p.m.? Today, there's only one thing. It starts at 4 p.m., and the title is, Hey Siri, read my note from today. <laughs> Your note from today says, Alexa, tell me about my 3 right. p.m. appointment. How does that go on for? As long as you want. <laughs> so this. Uh, I don't know if you saw the beginning of this. This one, this one was the interesting bit, actually, was the title. It said, Looping AIs. And then we watch it and we're like, well, so much for intelligence. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> sorry, let me get back in here. Um, what, is, what, is, what is intelligence anyway? Um, it helps to, to uh, go back a little bit and, and um, see what some other people have said about this. There is some, something um, called weak and strong AI, and this has actually been around in the, in the field of AI for quite a while, um, and this was John Searle way back in the 80s. Um, so he said there's weak, there's weak AI and there's strong AI. Weak AI is a focus on a narrow task, and strong AI is what most people think when they think AI. AI, it's the it's this smart thing. It's like people, um, like Jarvis on Iron Man or something like that. But just so you know, everything that we have up until now is weak AI, very much so. Self-driving cars, weak AI. These, um, these, these personal assistants, also weak AI, very weak AI. We're nowhere close to strong AI. And if you want to debate me on that sometime, fine, fine. Um, there's classical AI, which is connecting symbols, because the connotation of AI has changed in the last five years to really point to anything that is programming. <laughs> um, I added an if statement. It's, it's AI. It's not quite like that. There's, the classical AI is a field that has been around for a very long time, very interesting stuff. If you take a field on artificial intelligence and it doesn't have um, um, these connection, this sim symbol, symbolic connection things like graph theory and network theory, then you're missing out. Um, so the new thing that people are using right now is artificial, narrow, general, and super intelligence. Uh, narrow being something like these AIs that we've, we've seen generals, more like human intelligence, and then maybe, maybe one day they can do things that even humans can't do. There's hype, there's panic. Facebook engineers panic, pull plug on AI after bots develop their own language. No, they didn't. That's not at all what happens, but that's fun, right? That, that makes good headlines and people click on it and it goes on. <clears throat> um, you heard Google Duplex. Maybe you saw that video, that was very impressive. Um, there's a lot of stuff going on there that makes, makes it sort of leap forward in, in uh, artificial intelligence, at least in speech. But there's a lot of stuff that it can't do. Um, and then there's this guy, our friend Ishiguro over in, in, uh, in Osaka. He's building robots that don't do anything, but they sure look like humans. So one of these is a robot. If you, if you can't tell which one, then he's done a really good job. <laughs> but is that enough? To, is that enough? He's banking on the, on the assumption, and this is a very good one, that humans assign anthropomorphic features to robots when they look at them just like we do to each other. You look at a person, you know in about half a second if you are assigning intelligence to that person or if you think they, <laughs> I'm not making this stuff up. They've done research on this. So, so he's banking on that. And there's a whole field of human robotic interaction where they look at this. 
people, someone looks at a robot, they tell you right away, this is a male or a female, or the age, or whatever. It's, it's totally, I mean, it, it, it tells us a lot about ourselves, um, but our, obviously when it comes to intelligence, looking smart isn't enough. Um, that's not to say that robots aren't awesome. They are awesome, they play a very, very important role in AI, but they aren't the same thing. So what's missing? There's two things I, I wanna talk about. One is affordances. That is the abilities that one recognizes. So if I am a uh, intelligent person, which I hope that I am, and I see, I see this, this object over here, I think it, this affords me the ability to sit, and I can sit in it. Or I see a hammer, it affords me the, the ability to build something or whatever. You can kind of look at things for what they do, what they extend to you. Um, also yourself, your internal affordances. Like if you've ever seen a child discover his or her hands, it's amazing. Um, and then they, they realize that they have this hand and their own affordances, internal affordances are extended. And that's the level of intelligence. So robotics, they, do, they spend a lot of time doing this. So you put a robot in a room, it goes around and looks at objects and it has to reason, what can I do with this object? Can I step up on top of it? Can I pick it up? Can I, can I kick it, push it, something like that? And um, I should spend more time talking about affordances. Unfortunately, that's all the time I'm gonna spend today talking about affordances. Um, I'm gonna talk about language in particular speech. The most fundamental and natural way for humans to interact with each other is spoken dialogue. And before you say, whatever, I text more than I talk. The way children learn their first language is through interactive dialogue, and there's, there's plenty of research on this. You cannot put a child in front of a TV and have them learn language. You cannot put a child in front of a book and have them learn the language. They have to interact with people using speech. This, of course, uh, the exception, of course, is, is deaf people who, who learn um, sign language, but that is still an interactive process. You don't learn writing or talking on the phone or more specialized versions of using language until you, until you have co-located person-to-person speech understood. So I'm going with that. <clears throat> so part of what it means to be intelligent means at least to be able to understand and respond to speech. I'm talking about general intelligence here. Gotta have it. Even if the driving car does everything, never gets in an accident, still narrow intelligence unless you can talk to it. That's my, that's my stance here. So let's talk about language. Anybody know what this means? The limit to my language denotes the limit to my world. And this is our friend Wittgenstein, um, who you may have heard of, but he's, he's, he's onto something here. When you think of something and you want to formulate it and reason about it, you often think about it in words, in language, right? Mostly. There are things maybe that you think about that you can't articulate. So this is kind of getting there. And perhaps you've seen this movie um, they, took it, they took that notion to its somewhat illogical extreme where she learned a foreign language and magically had the affordance of being able to, like, I guess, think ahead in time. Um, but hey, a linguist saved the world, so I guess that's realistic. Next one, um, language. The, the reason why language is, is so hard and is an artificial intelligence field, why it hasn't been solved yet in terms of conveying language and understanding, I'm talking about natural language here, and conveying that into machines. Um, is because of ambiguity. The quality of being open to more than, one, or more than one interpretation or inexactness, that's ambiguity. This is why AI isn't very I. <clears throat> and I know, I know about neural networks, I teach the class, they can't handle it right now, I'm perfectly aware of embeddings and I'm perfectly aware of LSTMs and the list goes on, they can't handle language to the degree that I want them to, so just, <laughs> just, okay. Let's get that out of the way. It's a miracle that we can communicate at all because there's a way I think, there's a way you think, there's a way I think you think, and there's a way you think I think, and communication happens at, at this think I think you think you think I think level, and that's just, it's just. And then there's mismatch, and I don't, we don't want to get into that. So don't make the mistake of thinking that just because you can speak means you understand linguistics. It's like, I have a body, it doesn't mean I know as much as a physician does about my body, for example. They have, to go for, they have to go get a really, really long education to be able to be your doctor. Thank goodness. Um, but just because you have a body doesn't mean you know, you know all about it. And just because you uh, know language means you, because you can speak means you understand linguistics. <clears throat> Here's an example. I love ambiguity more than most people. I love ambiguity more than most people. It's ambiguous. Just read that. Okay. <laughs> Adjectives in English absolutely have to be in this order. Opinion size, age, shape, color. That's British spelling of color. Origin, material, purpose, noun. So you can have a lovely little old rectangular green French silver whittling knife, but if you mess with that word 
order in the slightest, you'll sound like a maniac. And you all know this as native English speakers, good job, but you didn't know this. You didn't meta know this, let's put it that way. Let's talk more about ambiguities. Every person loves a cat. Same cat or different cats? We all love this cat. <laughs> Yana's boss said she was doing better. Wait, Yana or her boss? Who's doing better? I need to make a stop at the bank. If you're in downtown Boise, you're like, well, obviously it's, it's like one of the 20 banks around here. But if you're up in <clears throat> the Sawtooth, you're like, I need to make a stop at the bank. It's a bank of a river. So there's ambiguity in word sense. She's a poor piano player. Is she bad at piano or out of money? <laughs> <laughs> So these are amb ambiguities, simple ambiguities that we can resolve with a little bit of context, but it turns out machines have a really, really, really hard time with these. Um, explain Newton's first law of motion in your own words, so he makes them up, makes up a completely new language, and ambiguity, right? <laughs> Loopholes, ambiguity, it's like all over the place. So part of what it means to be intelligent is being able to handle ambiguity. Ambiguity is not algorithmically solvable. Our field has been struggling with this problem for years. Struggle no more, I'm here to solve it with algorithms. He has his laptop. Six months later, wow, this problem's really hard. You don't say. <laughs> we can replace algorithms now with machine learning, and you get the same, the same sort of a thing. There are problems that haven't been solved before that are, let's say they've raised the asymptote, but solved, let's not go there. So um, I'm going to tell you about some of the research that I'm doing. There's my current group. A um, number of people have graduated and moved on. Um, the first person there is a part-time PhD student. Uh, the next, uh, Prajita, all the way down to Jake and uh, Sam, actually, are all master's students. Um, some work full-time, some are students full-time, and kind of everything in between. Um, Daniela, Alex, and Heather are all uh, undergraduate, undergraduates who are part of my research group. And they all do very cool things. I want to talk about not all of the things they're doing, but some of the things they're doing. And there is a rhyme or reason to, to why I'm doing this. I'll kind of bring it all together at the end. Um, my long-term goal is to find meaning. <clears throat> we can stop there, but. <laughs> meaning of language through personal, interpersonal, and societal groundings that take place through interaction. Let's break that apart in a moment. So I primarily do research in natural language processing, dialogue, semantics, computer vision, robotics, machine learning, and data science. Those are all tools in my toolbox, as it were. And I gain inspiration for psycholinguistics, child development, neuroscience, psychology, statistics, and probability and information theory, and um, any more linear algebra. Um, <clears throat> so I don't do research in those areas, but I read those papers to try to get ideas and gain inspiration on what to do next. Let's talk about meaning, i.e. semantics. Semantics is about the relation of words to thoughts, but it's also about the relation of words to other human concerns. Semantics is about the relation to words of words to the reality, the way that speakers commit themselves to a shared understanding of the truth and the way their thoughts are anchored to things and situations in the world. That sums it up. So I want you to think about meaning, and specifically meaning of language. This is what I think about all day, every day, and I can't get enough of it. If I could stay awake longer and not have to sleep at night, I would spend more time thinking about this. Lexical meaning, so meaning of a word. Let's, let's, I mean, there's language, there's meaning in general, there's language meaning, there's meaning of, say, a document or a sentence, but let's talk about the meaning of a word. And let's pick, let's, uh, we'll see some examples here, but think about that. What does it mean to mean, a, what does a word mean? Um, let's jump into some, some things that philosophers have said. We have Gottlob Frege, he said there's a difference between sense and reference. We have, and then he brought us the principle of compositionality, which I've been beating my head against the wall for the past like two months about this. I don't agree with anything anyone says in the field. If you want to talk about principle of compositionality, please come to my office and we'll talk about the principle of compositionality. I would love that. So um, John Stuart Mill, connotation and denotation, Carnap intention and extension, kind of technical. I'll seem to conclude that there is a difference between the essence of a thing and the actual designation of a thing. We'll look at an example here in a moment. Put another way. We have the prototypical meaning of words in our heads, but those meanings can be used to denote actual things. So here's two people walking through the snow. I guess Hobbes isn't a person, but you know, Calvin, and they see this object over here, and Calvin says, what red square? And they walk down the, the sidewalk a little farther, and Calvin says, red triangle. And they walk down the sidewalk a little bit longer and a little bit farther, and Calvin says, red star. This is how, kind, of, kind of how kids do it, in a way. There's visually present objects. 
So these things are the denotations, the things that exist actually out in the real world. And then there's the things that are in their heads that they're, that they're picking up. As they go down the sidewalk and they see these three objects, Hobbes, may, who may not be able to speak English, hears this word red, 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 applied to these three different objects. And through that application finds that there's something similar about these three objects. What is it? It's one of the features that comes from these objects. You can categorize it as color. He may not know about the category of color yet, but he said, this thing looks the same as, as this in a certain way. And that's the thing that redness is. And then you can say, well, these things differ from each other in that this has sort of a, sh a shape like this. This has a different shape, and this has a different shape. And that's where you could get something like squareness, triangleness, and starness, if there is such a thing as starness. But you have, you have an idea of the shape of what a star is in your head. You don't even, and, and the way you've learned that is you've seen them before. And there's a lot of words like this that you learn the connotation for them because you've seen examples of them. But if you're someone who, but, but then you learn to abstract over that. You learn abstract concepts that aren't based on what I would say visually present or visual things like democracy or um, patience, right? <laughs> You, need, you, can, you can hear about examples of those, but it's not like someone can point at something and say, that, that, is a, that is a democracy. Not in the way that you can point at like a ball or a pine cone and say, that's a ball or a pine cone. So this is all fine, but really, where does meaning of words come from? <clears throat> it comes from you. It comes from each other. It comes from this thing we call grounding. It's a term used to denote several distinct aspects of language and communication. There's symbol grounding, which is where aspects of language are connected with aspects of things that language denotes, such as visual features, which is what I've been telling you so far. The, the, uh, the aspects of redness have something to do with the, the color. And then there's conversational grounding, where aspects of events that occur between two or more people are recorded for later use. And then there's societal grounding, which connects symbol and conversational grounding with the accepted uses of language in a particular community. So, <laughs> so here's, here's kind of how I've drawn it. This, is, this was me when I before I lost some weight. This is symbol grounding, conversational grounding, societal grounding. And so in this area, we have an individual who is interacting with the world and sees objects, feels objects, perceives objects. And this person comes along and says, oh, that's a, that's a red cross, or that's a blue T, or that's a something, I, oh, I don't know, a color, that's a P, <laughs> and so on. And the, this person could be telling this person words, and this person goes, yeah, yeah, red, got it, blue, got it. But how does this person know that this person isn't leading this person astray? Like, if a child's learning language for the first time, you could totally make crap up and say words, and the child says them. And that's, that's your communication medium with that child. You could totally do that, and they would learn that, and you'd have this one-on-one -on -one language, this, this two-person language. Wouldn't that be great? It would not be great, because then the child could not interact with everybody else in the society. That's where societal grounding is. So me, I, who interact with, with other people all the time, and I talk to them, and I am constantly updating the way I understand words by hearing other people use words, and they hear me use words. This is a, a shared mediation thing. New words come, I learn it from other people, they learn it from me. And we, so we have this societal grounding. Conversational grounding is me interacting with my son, and he is learning about what words denote things through conversational grounding and through his own symbol grounding. So that's very, very high level overview, but you kind of get the idea here. <laughs> we don't have time for this, unfortunately. Kevin here, um, it decides to throw out like the and, and a bunch of other stuff. He, he, he uses Kevin speak essentially. And what happens is no one can understand him. He's like, yes, me do. Yes, me do now, and, and stuff like that. And, and people are like, I don't understand what you're talking about if it's this or that, and there was ambiguity. And it's because he didn't follow the societal conventions of societal grounding. Anyway, I, you can look at that sometime. So we're finally down to um, some of the research I do, which is um, linking perception to language, so this, this symbol grounding part. Um, we've done some, really, some pretty interesting stuff. You, in order to do this kind of semantic learning, which is different from the, the, the stuff you, that was talked about last time with TDF, IDF, TF, IDF, and the, um, the uh, word embeddings, um, word de vec, and so on. The, this is very different. This one, <coughs> you represent objects. You represent actually actual physical things as some sort of, some sort of low-level features, or you can even represent them through a convolutional neural network if you really wanted to. 
Um, and then you can train classifiers using this. Um, and they can learn something. But I'm going to actually um, do this. Um, Daniela Moreau, who's, who's an undergraduate student of mine, came back from a, from a um, research experience undergraduate at Carnegie Mellon. He did something with soft robotics. So they, had, they were, they were um, taking these simulated hands like this, and they were, instead of putting actuators and stuff off the, on them like you would like for a traditional robot, they were making soft robotic hands and putting um, sort of simulated muscles on them. So if the muscle contracts, the finger contracts, kind of like how humans are. Um, and he brought this data back to me and said, can we do something with this? And I was like, totally. This, this sounds really interesting. We can do some symbol grounding stuff with this. So if I asked you to close your eyes and make a thumbs up, you could probably do it. Good job. Some of you actually tried it. <laughs> Just to make sure you're... Oh, good, yeah. It's, it's there. But that's, but that's my point. You don't have to be looking at your own. I mean, I mean, you could be like working at your computer. Your colleague comes in and says, are you going to lunch with us? And you kind of go like this, and you didn't see your hand, but you, know, you communicated. Because why? Not because you saw it. You're like, OK. It was because you felt it in your, in your hand. There's muscle memory. So the meaning of thumbs up isn't just what, your thumb, what it looks like and what it denotes, which is kind of a positive I agree with you. It's also grounded symbolically in muscle memory, kind of like we were talking about how the things are symbolically grounded in vision. So we took this, the, these, this, uh, co this code that I had and randomly kind of generated hand configurations and then gave them out to a, to a crowdsource website and said, describe this. And some people would take something like this and say, that's thumbs up, or like this and say, that's, um, that's peace, or like this and say, that's pointing. And they might have something like, like this hand configuration right here. And this one gets kind of, this one's kind of weird, so they have a much longer description for it. There isn't kind of a, a denotative word for it or a short description or a short phrase for it. So um, we collected these and we, we uh, ran these through our model and it was pretty cool um, what we found. We found that um, you can gain a lot by, now nah, this gets complicated. You can gain a lot by, by adding this information. So if you represent th these, these um, hand configurations with some sort of a visual representation like, like um, contours in color or um, some higher layer of a convolutional neural network, you can, you can get a lot out of that. But if you add in the muscle, the simulated muscle um, activations, you can get even more information out of it and you can do some really cool stuff with this. So we found that if you use the two different modalities, it works better than if you just use visual versus if you just use muscle. Um, and then, and then uh, my student, um, Daniela, did a really cool thing. He said, what happens if we take our, our model and we give our, our hand, all of, all of our hands to it and kind of, or, or, or pick a word like point and give all of the hands to it and ask it to rank them and say, which one is the most like point and rank them from top to bottom. And then take the first 100 of those and sort of blend them together and see what, see what the prototypical point is that this thing learns. And it's something like this. This is kind of a left hand pointing up and then other people said, this is pointing if it was kind of from this view. And then another one was pointing from this view. And then interestingly, there's another um, uh, perspective that we had, and that was pointing kind of straight looking at it. No one called, used the word point when they were describing that. So um, our model learned this sort of prototypical understanding of what pointing is um, with visual information and with um, simulated muscle activations. So that, that we thought was pretty cool. <clears throat> We're also working with, with, uh, with robots. And I, I, I enjoy robots, but I don't enjoy the hardware as much. I'm more of, a, more of a consumer of the robots. I just want to take a nice working robot and use it for, for my research. So one thing I've landed on is Cosmo here. Cosmo, I didn't bring a Cosmo. It's, it's about this big. It's not very big. It's a little toy robot that um, it's really marketed to children. Um, you can do code lab on it. It's really cool. But it also has a Python SDK, so we can get in and control it, and we can get information from it. So it's a nice platform. It's also relatively inexpensive. It's, less, it's fewer than $200. Um, so I have, a, I have a, a master's student who is working on navigation, tracking the it, Cosmos internal state. So you can think about how would this work with, with, with symbol, symbol grounding. A moment ago, we were like, OK, muscle memory has something to do with, with pointing and, and things like that. But what about, what about a robot? If, I, if, I'm, if I'm describing what a robot is doing and it has its, its forklift up like this, it learns that if it's doing this, that has something to do with the meaning of the word up. <clears throat> or if it's going in, the in a circle on the right. Or if it sees something through its little camera right here. That should, that should, we should be able to do some symbol grounding with that. So symbol grounding to what it's perceiving, but also internally in itself. 
Um, so we have all this stuff, and we have this um, platform for situated intelligence, which we use from Microsoft Research that we use to log all this information and replay it. Um, so this is one, this is just kind of a research platform that we're using, and we're still in the process of getting it going. But one thing that happened when we, when I set some students on this, I was like, let's use, let's use Cosmo for symbol grounding and conversational grounding and, and, you know, language learning applications and see what we can't do, apply a semantic model to it. And um, I had a student who was like, okay, you mean like uh, first language acquisition, like when, when adults are teaching their children about language, right? Like they're learning language for the first time. I was like, yes. And they're like, do, can we assume that they're going to treat it like they're supposed to? Like they see this robot, what if they treat it like an adult because it's a robot? That would be bad, right? That would be really bad. We want, we want, we want to not make that assumption. So we did a study. <laughs> How do humans perceive robots? And there's a lot of work that's been done on this, and this is work with three undergraduates. Um, what we want is adults must perceive, we want them to perceive a robot as they would a child, and so we have this kind of test where we took three robots. One was this kabuki. We turned it on and didn't really do anything with it. We had kind of this Wizard of Oz setup where someone was behind the curtains and was controlling, the ro controlling what the, the robot was saying and doing. Um, and we had some people come in and just build little puzzles with it, kind of explain what, uh, what words were, um, what the puzzles were, and uh, just really practice with, uh, with, with these robots. And we had a Kabuki, we also put in Cosmo, and then we had a system where it wasn't any robot at all, it was just kind of a, a dialogue system. Um, <clears throat> and we tested all three of them. We, we collected their, their audio, did some linguistic analysis, we collected their, a video of them, and you can actually do, um, you can actually do something like this where you can send uh, pictures of participants and it'll give you a, a distribution over eight different uh, emotional states, facial emotional states back. I like this one. It's got some contempt in there. <laughs> and there was contempt. It was actually interesting. Contempt correlated with when they thought the robot was smart but wasn't acting as smart as they wanted it to. They hated that. <laughs> And, and, we, and we, we found some, and we had a questionnaire that we had them fill out that we could kind of correlate everything. But we did all this analysis with emotions, prosody is the sort of speech contours that's going through linguistic analysis. We transcribed um, automatically their, the, what they said and then passed that through some linguistic analyzers, syntactic parses and stuff, and then their questionnaires. And um, manner of speech is important, and they perceive Cosmo as a child, so thank goodness. Now we can use Cosmo as the platform that we want, wanted to all along for doing language acquisition studies. Um, another thing is this, perhaps you've seen this before in, in neural networks, object detection. This is ongoing work with Harvard Caracas. Um, if you're not familiar, I mean, you can take a, a fairly deep convolutional neural network and you can give it lots of training data and it will find objects within a scene and it will label them. Like, here's a dog, here's a bicycle, here's a car. And um, I don't want to do that. I'm glad people are doing that, but I actually don't want, I don't want those labels. I want to get rid of that. Instead of having a a uh, convolutional neural network that can give me like a distribution over like a thousand possible object types. I just want it to tell me if it's an object or not. And there's, there's actually quite a bit of developmental science that says that's actually how children do it. They're interacting with objects. They, can, they have a fundamental understanding of what an object is, a holistic object, before they start to learn language, pre-linguistically. So, so when we come in and, and start saying words that denote objects, they should already know more or less that this is an object. It has certain things, like I can pick it. It has certain affordances. I can pick it up. I can move it. It's smooth. They don't have words for those things, but they have, con they have sort of um, underlying concepts for those. So he's working on a, on a type of um, object detector that doesn't care about the, uh, the labels, and it turns out it's a lot faster because it's not trying to get this big, complicated distribution over the pos all the possible types. Um, so it's very fast. Um, in terms of accuracy, it's like, yeah, it's an object. Good job. But I want my model, I want my model to take this information from here and then give it a label. And the label isn't just a noun. The label could be something like, well, this is a bike, but it's also a red bike. There's a lot of attributes, attribute words that we use that aren't in these, aren't in these fancy object detector, uh, object, object recognizers. And um, I want to fix that. There's some other stuff we've been working on. <clears throat> uh, like here's a chat bot that can remember stuff for you. Um, um, but this is the second to last slide I have, just so you'd kind of see that we're not, I'm not just throwing stuff out there and hoping that something sticks. There is, a, there is kind of a goal to, to my research. The, the goal is understanding, remember, it's, it's finding meaning. Um, and some of the stuff I've done up until now kind of goes down this semantics road. So this is kind of happening in parallel stuff I did with um, Daniela Moreau is here. 
And then, of course, um, perception has something to do with that for, for the symbol grounding part, so that's got to be in there. And then, of course, we have the, the embodiment part, which is the, uh, the social robotics, and then, of course, the robot itself that we can actually use as a platform. And then we connect perception to that, and then we put our semantic model in the robot finally, and then we do, do our studies and everything will work out and everyone will be happy. But that's, um, I can go into depth in some of these things if you have some questions, but that's it. That's it for me, just talking about generally about my research. And um, I hope you've thought a little bit about language, a little bit about meaning, a little bit, a little, a little bit more about what it means to be intelligent, and that you question some of these claims that are made when you read these awesome headlines. Um, but thank you, and I have some time for questions. Do you uh, feel that strong AI is more than just a collection of weak AI? Oh. So well, sure. Question was, um, is, is strong AI really just a composition of a bunch of weak AI things? Um, <laughs> I would say it has to be. Kind of like, I mean, you're a, humans are a composition of organs. That's cool. But really, when it comes to the intelligent part, it's, it's this holistic thing that's not just like, I have, I have the ability to speak, but I also have the ability to drive a car, and I also have the ability to do this, and those are separate components, so they're different parts of me. That's not the case. You have a general intelligence ability, and you apply that in different, different areas. So um, there are, of course, portions of the brain that have been shown to be used for different things, like there's the visual cortex, there's, there's the language centers. Um, but New studies show that there is really a lot more interconnection than, than was, was thought. It's not as modular as people thought, the brain. There is some modularity, but not as, it's not as deep as you think. Um, so holistic, general intelligence is something that really is, can learn anything. That's my, my, yeah, my theory. Yeah. Other questions? In the back. Yes. Um, here you are. But you're not artificial, so I guess that's cool. <laughs> um, so, so my, I, I hope so. That's what I'm working for. Will we reach it? Um, I, I don't know. Because the more, the more we learn about artificial intelligence, the more we realize how limited it is. Um, but the more we use artificial intelligence, the more we learn about ourselves. That's ultimately why I'm doing this. It's like, I want to learn what language is. I really want to know that. And I think that would be helpful to know that. For, for people at large. Um, but, <laughs> and so that's why I actually kind of have a problem with neural networks because they're these big black boxes. And I'm like, okay, learn this thing and it does this thing really amazingly. How? Nobody knows. And that's annoying. So I'm the, and I like them, I'll, I'll apply them for practical, for practical things. If, 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 if a neural network can give me a diagnosis very accurately about some, some, uh, some health problem, you know, with high accuracy, very fast, so it, and it helps with turnaround. Like I see, these are all very, very good things. Um, but ultimately, when I do my my kernel, my core research, I, I'm interested in what language is, what intelligence is, what understanding is, what meaning is, all that stuff. And I need to be able to interpret the model to do that. Um, and I think we have to do that if we want to get to general intelligence. Because if we if we have a thing and it's general intelligent and it does everything, can learn anything, and it can't say anything about how we do it, how it does it. Yeah, then, then we're, what's the point? Because we're just making copies of ourselves because we're still working on that with ourselves. I guess maybe it's, it's more ethical to cut them open and like see what's going on inside. I don't know. Other questions? I've, is it too late in the day? Yes. What would you say the most impressive recent development in AI is? Oh, gosh, I don't, back propagation. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, large scale stuff. Uh, so, so an actual application where it's being used, or a technology, or just uh, probably a technology. A technology. So neural networks are big, right? They're, they're obviously the thing. Be because of neural networks, we have AI is what it is today. So I started my PhD in October 2011. You probably don't remember the the momentous thing that happened that month, that year. That's when Siri was released, and Siri was like kind of this laughable thing then. But now we have Alexa, now we have Google, Google Home, now we, you know, the Assistant, and we have Duplex, which is amazing. Neural networks were a really big part of that because they, it changed the way speech recognition was done. Before it was these sort of graphical models, these, these hidden Markov models, and then they decided, let's do an end-to-end -end thing that goes from, from the speech directly to, or the speech signal directly to transcription, and it works so much better. And um, 
that, that changed my field, because I was working on spoken dialogue systems and it, speech recognition was always this problem. So I think that, if, if I had to pinpoint a, a task, it would be actually be speech recognition, because now suddenly we can talk to things, and it's worth it. Like, there's still problems with Siri. There's still problems with Alexa. You still have to do all this weird ping pong verbal thing with them, and it messes up a lot, and transcription and understanding aren't the same thing, and so on and so on and so on, and that's something that people like me are trying to improve, but um, the fact that people trust speech recognition enough to use it, I mean, do you dictate texts? I do all the time, it's great. I know it doesn't work, I know it works well the best for adult males <laughs> who are native English speakers, everyone else is kind of like, yeah, I gotta fix a lot of problems, but it, th there's a lot of, th there's progress being made there. So I, I would, if I were to choose something, at least for my field of speech recognition, I'm very happy that that's there. Neural networks, obviously, and all the, all the underlying frameworks that have improved neural networks have, been, have advanced it very big, in a very big way. But um, the scientific knowledge that has been gained from neural networks has been a lot, but there's a lot missing because it's, there are black boxes. Yeah? In a standalone AI system, what hardware is typically set up for the function? Well, it depends on... And I, I'm, not, um, I'm not copying out here, but it really depends. If you have a task like, like let's say, a self-driving car, it's going to need a lot of trained models, which have a lot of parameters, for every little thing, right? And different times of day. And not just pedestrians, but everything else. And then it has to have the internal logic about what to do, how to reason about what should I do next, given this, this circumstance. So they need, they need lots of GPUs. They need lots of... They need GPUs because ultimately everything is a matrix and if you want to do matrix operations, you better have a GPU for now. I mean, they're coming up with other things, but they, they, so co they it, cost too much. Can it, sorry, can it occur at the ASIC level? Um, I don't think so, but almost. But I'm, I'm not as adept at hardware as, as some of my colleagues are. <laughs> oh no, it's, it's, it's very important. So the question here was, um, what about cultural differences? I mean, particularly with, with language understanding, there's huge cultural differences. The societal grounding part is really culture. Um, and you know, I did my PhD and my master's in, in Germany and France, and that, that was very different. They had a very different approach to, to language processing than we do here in the United States, because we primarily, primarily work with English, which has a strict word, a word order syntax. So it's very nice to use simple, you know, sequence models, and it does a great job. But if you, use, if you try to apply these things on a language like, like German, which is very free word order, it just, it just doesn't do as well. Um, so, so not, and that's just, not just the language, it's also the, the weird nuances that people have, um, the weird meanings that, 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 that words have in those different cultures. Yeah, it's totally something that people are working on, but um, not everybody. Yes? sound that bad. <laughs> I'm not afraid of that at all. Okay. Uh, the, he's basically asking, should we be afraid right now of, of the singularity? And I'm like, not really. I know what neural networks can do and what they can't do. <laughs> <It's not> even, <laughs> no, we're not there yet. And, and it's fun uh, explaining that to people. I, will we get there? I don't, I don't know. I mean, people are pretty bad at each other already. So if, if an AI system learns to be mean to other people, it learned it from people just like people do. Yes? But, but on that note, isn't the bigger concern less about accidental and more about intentional, where you create AI that could, that could uh, attack your enemy? OK, so like you could do non-general here. You could have a weak AI thing that's going into a system and trying to break it, trying to hack it, whatever. Yeah, people, people do do that. Every technology has this problem. Yeah, yeah. So there's, there's always bad actors in every technology that comes along. Um, are we afraid of that? Yeah. but. There's always a way to stop. In fact, in fa but it, it also has lended itself to helping, helping the field. So there's these things called adversarial networks where um, someone came along and said, oh, these, these, this um, object detection thing, neural network, is really cool, but if I tweak these pixels a little bit, it totally blows up. And I can actually encode information in there, so it gives this distribution, gives this output, and then boom. And then there was another, another group that figured out you can use Siri to unlock a phone. 
with, by putting information in the speech signal. It would unlock it, and then you could have access to it. Pretty cool. But these are sort of white hat hackers, but there's other, other people who aren't so white hat hackers. But when we get that information, we know how to kind of guard against it. Yeah. Other questions? I've given you something to think about, I hope. Can, can AI code for us? Will we have jobs? <laughs> <laughs> Will we have jobs? No, that's, that's like the dream, right? Robots grow all our food and everything, and we just kind of go to the beach and do whatever we want, right? That's, that's kind of the goal. I don't know if that's the goal. I, don't, I can't imagine living life like that, to be honest. Um, Will they, I mean, there's some that can write very simple code, but they're very brittle, very, you know, very narrowly trained. Um, that's the general intelligence part. The reason why, I mean, maybe that's, that's the litmus test. If we can not just make a person, but a programmer. <laughs> now we have super intelligence. <laughs> We're done. And then it starts programming stuff, and who knows? Maybe it figures out how to... And that would, maybe, that's, maybe that's the answer. So we have a system that, uh, a fully super intelligent system that's like, you're like, explain yourself. And it's like, let me write a program that explains it. So it writes this program. Because you've probably heard the adage, you don't, know, you don't understand something until you've taught it to some, somebody else. Let's go a step further. You don't really understand something until you've programmed it. Like, you have to understand it completely. Like, it is part of you understanding it before you can put it into code, right? So let's say a, a machine that can code says, you want to understand what language is? Let me write a program for you. And it writes this program, and this beautiful program comes up, and you're like, oh, of course, that's, that's what meaning is in language and stuff like that. <laughs> Will we get to that point? No, I don't think so. <laughs> but this has been fun to think about that out loud in front of everybody. But <laughs> any, last, any last questions, last thoughts? Thank you very much. Thank you.